Welcome to the Great Bays Tennis Podcast. I'm Steve Smith along with Lawrence Hyde. Give me the high five, Lawrence Hyde. Hi, right, Steve. Podcast 191, Amateur Hour. We continue to try to become professional. With uh, Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde. Dr. Jekyll was a good guy, right? You're the bad guy? Jekyll was a good guy and Hyde was a monster that he turned into. P5 full farm. I smell the blood of an Englishman. Well, let's have a review session. Been great to have you here, Coach Lawrence Hyde from Great Britain. Um, taking notes. Let me start with giving him a test, see if he's going to graduate from his internship. Uh oh. Here we go. Myth test true or false? Toss high for more time. False. Vic Braden, you toss high, they give you more time to be crummy. The high toss, more variables. Falling at the rate of gravity, 32 feet per second per second. Number two. For Mr. Hyde, from Dr. J Jekyll, there's not enough time to change your grips on volleys. True or false? False. False. Dennis Vandermeer explained that so well. It takes more time, and he would demonstrate it. It'd take the same amount of time, but you have to be trained. Yeah. have to be trained from the get-go, day one. Number three, down together, up together is the best way to teach a beginner the serve. False. Yes. Actually, years ago on the Vic Braden uh, exam, United States Tennis Academy, USTA, had an exam with a film loop. I took it the second time. First time I got a 188, second time 197. It was the greatest academic achievement other than the third grade math award. And I had it wrong. I put down uh, the scissors was down together, up together. Scissors when you separate your arms. Number four, ground strokes are hit low to high. No, high, low, high. False. High, low, high. I mean, we could argue and say, well, gee, look at Michael Chang was a great player. He took the racket back low. As many players have taken it back, back low. Most efficiently, high, low, high. There's this thing called racket at speed, letting the racket fall with gravity. Number five, pressure on to pass your internship. The most advanced grip to volley is the Continental. False. Yes, that's true. True Continental grip doesn't stay on the forehand side, doesn't even face the court at the contact point. Doesn't even face the court you're standing on. Opens the racket to face a 45 degree angle. Mm -hmm. Turn the racket eight times. It has eight bevels, 360 degrees. 360 degrees divided by eight is 45. Most top pros of Bradenism, they don't say what they do or do what they say. Uh, but it, I like um, how Jose Guerra says that, almost a continental grip. Because there's no such thing as a perfect grip, just a grip with least amount of adjustment. And when the ball is slightly below the level of net, you certainly wouldn't want the grip just to be on the third panel, the eastern panel. So a composite used to be called the Australian grip. It's in between two and three. You nervous, Lawrence? Mm, no. Feeling, You're okay? You're okay? Feeling, feeling good. good. You've you got them all right so far. <laughs> the fastest way to recover for a shot is using shuffle steps. Incorrect. Crossover steps. Crossover steps. When you take a shuffle step, you end up taking one step and you're in the same spot. Uh, yeah, I was doing that as well. The movie called Wimbledon, the uh, leading actor, reading, leading actress said that they remembered with a technical advisor. I don't want to mention Pat Cash. It was Pat Cash. They just remember hearing racket back and shuffle, shuffle. You can actually get people to hit the ball really well as long as there's no ball. And that's what they did with the movie King Richard. The girls trained eight hours a day to mimic. Oh, what are your shadows? Mimic, yeah, mimic Venus and Serena's movements, and then then they superimpose the ball. Oh wow! Computer technology number seven for the Brit. Top spin is created by rolling the wrist. No, 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 false, false. So you don't believe in contact point, turn the doorknob or the windshield wiper. So, all right, strings must face the target. Don Leary word pitcher method. The hitting zone. It's like a loaf of bread. All right, now we'll go to number eight. To hit a slice serve, you must cup the ball. What do you mean, cup the ball? Like ice cream. You're going to bottom of the bottom of the barrel, you cup the ball. This way, you come to the side of the ball. If you're righty at three o'clock and you come around it, no, you I'd peel say, the orange. I'd say, oof, it's a tricky one. I'd say, uh, false. 
False is correct. The sensation or the, the common sense notion is that you do that. You bypass the side of the ball and then come around it. But the ball's only on the string three to six milliseconds. By the time you feel it, it hits almost 70 milliseconds. By the time you feel hit, the ball's 70 to 11 feet away from you. So, no, you could actually get results by telling people to get the feeling of doing that first. Okay, so moving on to number nine. It is best to stay down when hitting ground strokes. True or false? Uh, false. Feel good about your answer? You want to change it? Nope. Feel good about it. Okay. No um, you stay down with your eyes and your head, but you, mm -hmm. you lift. Top spin is a downward motion. It's generated with an upward motion of the body and racket. Yes. Okay. He may graduate. 10. Don't believe in parental pressure. Don't believe in peer pressure. Self-inflicted pressure. Here we go. To effect, effectively hit a kick serve, one must arch their back. Oh, false. It's really interesting, listeners. If someone has a palm up, almost all players start with a palm up. It's logical, intelligent. Put your rag at the pizza position, pull down. And unfortunately, players, junior players, for example, they make the change, but they don't make the change correctly. What they will do is they'll arch their back. They've been told to hit a kick serve, arch the back, toss over their head. So I know some of you are listening to this without a visual, but you just put the palm up. Now as you arch your back, you get the racket on edge. So the, they, they, learned hit, they learned to hit some spin, but no spin and speed and sense, calling up the uh, chiropractor, the orthopedic surgeon if you do that. The one thing about the kick serve, what makes the ball bounce high is really trajectory. And when they mm -hmm. arch their back and toss over their head, they do hit up, uh -huh. ball has a higher trajectory, but no speed. The late Braden on the serve, would you rather have a pea shooter or a bazooka gun? Okay, this is good. Number 11, always approach down the line. Uh, false. That's correct again. Lawrence Hyde from England, you know, we had a war to get rid of you guys. And how, how, did, you, how did they let you back in? Back in. So approach down the line. Like in politics, stay away from the word always and never. Cross court approach out is very effective, but you need to know the short ball range. Uncle Vic used to say, if you know the radius of the short ball range, you probably know a lot about tennis. You got to count out the number of steps it takes you to get behind your approach at an effective, efficient volume position. Number 12, you should come over the ball on a one-handed backhand for top spin. No, uh, false, sir. False is correct again. People get the sensation of coming over the ball because when they come from low to high, they don't hit the geometric center. And then what happens is it's, it's the racket displacement after the hit. So the way I'm sitting in the chair, if I were to come up with my palm for a forehand coming from below the ball and I hit below the geometric center, and the racket turns after the hit. Moving along, 13. Unlucky number for you or no? Good uh, no. Put your, put your hand out like this. Is that, you got it? Lawrence e. Baby, the power source on the serve is bending your knees. No. Ground reaction force, um, set anchors, you stabilize your front foot, it's a kinetic chain. There's so many power sources, but one, getting that toss out to the right for right hand or so you have to change the direction of the racket. The racket path that slows the racket down. Uh, so many power sources. I mean, letting your left arm be a react break, keeping your head still. Most kids shift. They sneak a peek. They think they've already hit. They've made all the computations. Andy Roddick, I've been listening to his podcast. I think it's, I'm going to guess it's number one right now in tennis. It's on TV. Um, I can listen to Roddick. Andy Roddick doesn't understand NASCAR. I don't understand four hours of turning left. Very good interview. Gift to Gab, he's got it. So um, he used to say he had no idea how he served. But now he says it's all in the legs. It's not having the legs go up and down like an elevator. Um, but it does start from the ground up. Okay, 14. You get this right, you get 100. And you get to move on. Come back for internship number two. On the return of serve, it is optimal to wait in your forehand grip either semi-Western or Western. False. And I would say you're 100% right, but another 100% is you go to a junior tournament 
almost 100% of players, young junior players, are waiting with a semi-western grip. The racket's not center. The racket's not in a neutral position. And if you were to look at this guy named Djokovic, mm-hmm. I always tell people, watch him in the ready position. Grip determines the angle the racket face. Uh, Jimmy Connors is an amazing returner, and he had the grip underneath on the foreign side, but he still had the racket centered. Still had the racket centered. You see a lot of the pros, don't you, with a slight, yeah, slight angle in the racket. No, I'm high on uh, Rubak in this game, but both her grips are slightly, slightly under. Mm. Um, no such thing again as a perfect grip; just a grip with least amount of adjustment. But the grip. You want to center the racket have turning initially with two grips on three. Boris Becker came along when the grass was still the old grass at Wimbledon. The balls were bouncing low. And, you know, he turned, people at that time said no one will ever win Wimbledon with an extreme grip. But he turned on three and he had the option of having the racket like a wall, wall to the ball, turn like a volley out of the volley that he had to follow through. What about Nadal? Because he's famous for the extreme grip. Did he center the racket? Yeah, it's interesting. Nadal over the years, uh, Try to go more towards the eastern grip. In other words, not being so far under so he could hit through the shot. The grip, once again, determines the angle of the racket face. So a lot of young kids, it's not just their grip, but it's the wrist position, elbow position. And because the grip is so extreme, the racket face is down, they have to play a really high contact point. And then the ball is above the larger body part, the hips. Um, with uh, Nadal and Federer, so much discussion on two great, great players. When Nadal turns with his grip for, like, say, a drop shot, he doesn't have as much disguise because he has to change the grip to an Eastern or to a composite. Where the, where the Fed, when he turns, he has that option. That's the thing, too, with option. With We always talk about Federer standing so close to the baseline. So Roddick was uh, the best player in America, give or take, for 10 straight years. And he didn't have an organized ready position. And he, he stood further back, had, had to take the time further back for the extra movement. Where Federer stood in close. And, you know, actually it came down to uh, our fact checker, Andres Barbosa, could look that up. But I think it's money to say that uh, Roger, what a great spot server, but he hit more aces than Roddick when they were head to head. But with Roddick, um, I like to quote the players, what he said about. Roger Federer himself, he's an artist, he's a technician, I just hit the crap out of the ball. So if you're, you do your homework, if you're gonna get an argument with a player, uh, it's good to be able to say, this is what the, the top players say. Mm. With Lawrence Hyde, you've been here for almost six weeks or five weeks, is that five yeah. full weeks? Yeah, All right. five weeks, yeah. Got some great notes here. We'll get to your notes. Wow, we can post this on our Facebook. Done some homework. Round of applause for Lawrence taking notes, rewriting notes. A couple of things I have uh, that will also remind people on Facebook. On um, our website, Joel Trucker was one of our guests, and along with Vic Braden. A uh, great article that made all the way to the cover of Tennis Magazine, Brain Typing with John Nagel. That's on the desk. A lot of things on the desk. One of the best hours of instruction ever. For me, maybe the best. Um, Storytelling for Mental Toughness, Dr. James Lair. We have some abbreviated notes from that. We'll put that on Facebook. That's a video, isn't it? Is that the hour video you're talking yeah, it's about? it's an audio. Oh, it's audio. It's an audio, yeah. With, um, what else do we have on the desk? Um, we'll put this on uh, Facebook. It's a letter, Jose Higueras, number six player in the world. From Spain originally, now he's a U.S. citizen. He has so much to do with the USDA player development. And he's not happy with a lot of the changes, budget cuts being one of them. So that's an interesting letter. Um, another interesting letter, just in reading Jose's letter, so many people send that to me, and it made me think of the one that's been forgotten. Um, Wayne Bryan, the father of the twins, what an outstanding job they did as parents, Kathy Blake and Wayne Bryan. He says in this letter, which um, when he wrote it, my understanding that uh, he didn't think it was going to go public, 
get rid of the USDA player development program altogether. So it's interesting. But let's go with your notes here. Yeah. Um, you want to do me a favor and reopen that for us? <laughs> the mind vitamins. Oh, yeah, yeah. Uh, but I've got down with... Um, Can we start on our favorite mind vitamin as well? Steve? Yeah, but let's do that. But I've got down here with, with you being here, um, 20 visiting players from out of state or out of country. We, um, we did a workshop with many uh, visitors flying from here, there, and everywhere in Charlotte. Thanks for people for Tennis Block for organizing that. We went to a women's college tennis match at the University of Virginia. Men's match. We worked with a high school team. Uh, we did some video work with college players online, watching their matches. I did that with uh, ITF junior tournaments. Uh, you helped me with a podcast with Mark Bay. Um, number of lectures, interventions with players reflections so meeting after meeting parent training so um we've covered quite a bit in your time here i think we put in light days or long days so long days the long days yeah what eight to eight to ten hour days every day days are long yes they, so days are long and decades are short okay yeah you read off a of mind vitamin and I'll maybe add a comment. What do you got? If you want, very impressive notes though. Wow. If you want to fly like an eagle, you can't no, if you want to soar like an eagle, you can't fly with turkeys. Yeah. I like that one a lot. Yeah, one will remind me of another uh Gareth Doran said to my son one time, because he saw the immaturity of my son and his high school teammates, he said Garrett Doran, older brother John Doran, uh, from Ireland, they uh, pretty impressive backgrounds to find their way to be in the states, uh, studying at Harvard and playing tennis there as well. What he said, my father would say, um, "Be be friendly, but don't be their friends." Mm. Yeah, I, like I one that. time heard uh, one older brother say to a younger brother, Nathan Zeter said to Evan Zeter. Nathan's really successful in real estate in Miami. His brother, Evan, is with New Balance. You see him in the booth with uh, Coco Goff. Spent very little time with uh, Nathan, but helped Evan rebuild his game when he was like 14, 15 years old. And I heard the older brother tell the younger player, the older, older brother tell the younger brother, you need some new friends. <laughs> okay, give us another one. Um, if you... If you coast, you toast. And I, if, you, if you cruise, you lose. If you coast, you, you're toast. With burnout, a lot to be said about burnout, but when kids complain that they're burning out, Braden used to say, tennis doesn't burn people out, people burn people out. But really, I like the idea that it's a frustration factor. People don't burn out, they get frustrated. If you're, you have the same holes in your game, you're practicing hour after hour, you hit a ceiling and you're not going to get better. Um, I like the line you have to catch on fire before you burn out. Mm. You know, most most young kids, most young kids who quit, um, they haven't even started. You know, they just it's, it's really interesting how many players quit after the first tournament. And you know, unfortunately, a lot of parents don't know they take their kid to a tournament and they're not prepared at all. I like the Russian mentality where you have to practice three thousand hours before you play. The Russian formula different than the U.S. In the U.S., um, people certainly beat up on the USTA, but a theme for a while was, or maybe it still is, it's not play to learn, it's learn to play. And what's been very prevalent in the industry is game-based training. Well, game-based training is fun. It's like basketball kids. Can we scrimmage, coach? Can we scrimmage? What you need is a combination of game-based and form-based, and then together you call it principle-based. But you can have contests where you know how these kids will move up and move down. Um, you can do it where you're drop hitting in the alley and keep score. Mm -hmm. Winners moves up, losers move down. Because people love a contest. Um, all the years we spent with Jim Lair, he used to have kids play, and then he would just make some notes. 
He was a big fan of Jim Verdick, so he'd have a clipboard. You'd write a few things down, and you would move up based on your body language, not whether you won or lost. Um, you could you could do that where people can play, move up, move down, and now the people who show the most patterns. Oh wow! That's you know, like good. you know, like can someone arc arc the ball high and deep? You know, a lot of times in Arthur Ashe lines, people cop out. They just hit a drop shot out of nowhere. You know, they they cop out. Okay, I'm out of this rally. Instead of oh no, I'm gonna I'm going to bring the fish up to the net, a fish out of water. I'm going to throw a high arcing ball and make them move back and hit the drop shot from three quarters court. I remember Brad Gilbert being in the booth with uh, Andy Murray and he complimented Murray on how effective his drop shot was. And Murray said, I thought you hated drop shot. He goes, no, that was when you were, you know, just first coming into the pro tour and you were hitting drop shots whenever you wanted. You have to maneuver the, Player, get the you get your opponent further back. All right, Lawrencey baby, give me another mind vitamin. Um, I'm not sure, I'd have to have a little look at that. Is there one on there? Let's get my uh, you know, let me get my laptop. Actually. You get your laptop. All right, I'll read one while you're getting your laptop out. Don't don't judge the unfinished product. People will look at our line, our content online and go, they don't teach any racket at speed. Well, they're showing you how to teach eight-year-olds forehand. Be, be aware of paralysis by analysis as, as a tennis teacher. Yep. You know, when we make those videotapes, you had one made upon arrival. It's not paralysis by analysis if people go about it the right way. You watch the, t the tape three times. First time straight through. Second time you stop and start your tape, take notes. Third time. Write down logical sequential order of the adjustments you need to make. But then you get in front of a mirror and you you go through that. So many things that we can talk about with uh let's go through a few mind vitamins though. I'd like um you do not lose a bad habit, you must override it with a new habit. Habit, that's the old word for myelin. You know, people have good myelin and bad myelin. I'm forever telling young kids, you know, you're gonna get better at getting worse. Let me say that correctly. You're getting better at getting worse because the longer, say someone has a open racket face on the backhand and they can't use gravity letting the racket free fall. It's just like a kid riding a swing set. It's twisted in the back. It's going to be twisted in the front. Have a short hitting zone. And if they've been doing that for five years, you know, check your ego at the door and you've got to go to work. And, you know, myelin, the substance the brain produces, how the neural pathways are encoded with a white substance and the greater the mile and the greater the fluency the speed and smoothness of movement um yeah old habits die hard what else you got i really like the john wooden one as well uh, the fundamental doesn't change only the speed at which you must execute that fundamental yeah my oldest brother who spent a lot of time in hockey um GM twice, associate GM once of three different NHL hockey teams. See the difference, Pee Wee hockey and uh, NHL hockey are the same, it's just different speed. Mm. Mistakes, mistake. With, there's so many John Wooden quotes, the late great basketball coach from UCLA. I like the one where he says, uh, don't mistake activity for learning. That's yeah, ju sure. junior development programs, that's just activity. No one's learning. Yeah, yeah. Another one with John Wooden is um, never try to be better than your opponent. Never try to be better than your opponent. Just try to be better than yourself. What else here, Lawrencey baby? Um, champions are made when no one is looking. Uh, you have to do stuff on your own. If you only do what the coaches tell you, it will, it will not be enough. That story comes from Mia Hamm, the soccer player. And she's playing in North Carolina, where their record is just off the charts. Daniel Coyle added to it with being such a prolific writer. So Mia Hamm was practicing with her teammates. Teammate, the practice is over. Coach says he has two, two ways home, the fast way and the slow way. The slow way is a little more scenic, and he drives by a, a private school with a beautiful soccer field. And as he takes the slow road home, 
right at, not that long after practice, went back in his office and did a few things. Me, Ham's on the high school field practicing. So he just parked and watched, and he waited a couple of days to ask her. And he said, why don't you just do the extra practice here? And she said, I don't want to take the conference away from my teammates. They, they can't work as hard as I can. So that's where that comes from. Champions are made, no one's watching. But what Daniel Coyle added to is they're um, gasping for air, dripping in sweat. There's one more. They're, yeah, they're bent over at the waist, gasping for air, dripping in sweat. Anyway, he adds to it. What else, sir? Um, we've got uh, life gives you the test first and the lesson second. Yeah, I'm sure that's been around forever, but I remember the late Peter Burwash saying that. For me, if you hear something, uh, you really like it, you got to repeat it, you got to make it a story. I heard so and so say, um, and then what you're doing also is you're giving credit to the person, you, you make it a story. You're not being pretentious, like, well, this is what I think. It's saying, no, I heard this from so and so, and I just love it. Make it, make it a story. Yes, sir. Uh, one you said today from uh, Aristotle, we are what we repeatedly do. Yeah, you've got tons of these, huh? And I like the, you're either a faucet or a drain. I like that one as well. Yeah, think about that. With, with uh, Another way to say that to kids, I have to explain it to them, but parents, if someone says that your kid is low maintenance, that is a great compliment. You don't want your kid to be high maintenance. They, you know, they make the coach feel like a babysitter. But yeah, I mean, I make kids all the time come on in and you know run in, and the person we have to come in because someone is just not doing what they're supposed to, and I make that person apologize to the group. We could be hitting more balls, but I had everybody run in. We've got to go through it another time, and again, that person is a drain. They just they just zap the energy from people. You know, we all know the importance of flowing water, you know, the life lifeline for all of us is to uh, be the faucet. Yes, sir. No one? Yeah. Um, the one you said, I think it was yesterday. I don't know if it was from Ash Barty, but uh, chips will fall where they fall. Uh, it is not a life or death situation. It's all about skills, not winning or losing. Yeah, the Aussies, I think, study Aussie tennis. Uh, Roger Federer has a big connection with Aussie tennis. Peter Carter, Tony Roach, with Ash Barty. Yeah, you're going to either win or lose. Mm. The chips will fall where they fall. I love the Aussie uh, mind vitamin. No worries, mate. And I do think that the Aussies, because what they did in the 50s and 60s, um, I think most Australians would tell you that's fading away, but uh, the, the education, the history, um, Einstein, if you don't know the history of your subject, you don't know your subject. Here's one, uh, fact-based instruction for long-term development. Those people who run junior development programs do this. It comes from Vandermeer. You have a choice. You can go over here and do match play and simulated drills or go over here and do um, fact-based instruction for long-term development. Mm. And just call it that way, and then the juniors, they're going to choose scrimmaging. But over time, um, I spent a lot of time with Dennis Vanderbilt. I did that in Tyler, Texas, where um, three days a week, six days of training, we had three days where it was match play, simulated drills, and three days where we just came out and did the slow work, as some people would say. And then the people who do that work in the end, I know who I'm betting on. Go ahead, sir. Uh, if if you meet triumph and disaster the same, you will end up a champion. That's a Nadal quote, isn't it? No, you'll no. Nadal. Um, uh, Coach uh, Ilya was here visiting, and uh, he was on, our, I guess, on our last podcast, and he plays the, the motivational rap. And you know, there's mm. there's tapes where. You know, Fetter's talking about work ethic and Nadal's talking about work ethic. But, um, no, that's at the two-minute waiting room at Wimbledon. And it's from a poem. That'll be our homework. Yeah. To uh, Brandon Flanagan, who's helped with the podcast at his uh, FM Tennis Center. 
has it right above where you walk in the gym. If you meet with triumph and disaster and treat those two imposters just the same, you're a champion. Um, so triumph and disaster, triumph winning, disaster losing. But on the tape we were listening to is Nadal reads it. Yeah, that's it, yeah. Yeah, that's where you heard it. Go ahead. Uh, pra practice like you play, play like, play like you practice. Roger Federer should be a book of quotes on Roger Federer. I mean, if you won't listen to Roger Federer about tennis, who are you going to listen to? I love the Roger Federer quote. I didn't know you were supposed to win in practice. Now, we just had a young visitor, outstanding piano player. It was fun to have him play for us. And you could just, you could play by ear as well as by just reading yeah. music. And Phenomenal. name off a song. He just has his ears and starts to play it. He's only 12. <laughs> but he's been playing for nine years with a piano player or any um, musical instrument for that matter. Can you imagine if you just play one song? And I think that's what tennis kids are doing that are staying back and just looking to wall up beforehand. I mean, the serve and volleys a song, the underspin backhand approach, all the, the patterns that we talked about. You know, that was one, that was part of your internship is that we went through that. We had a young girl who's good enough to, uh, be traveling around for being rep she represents canada and she was here with her parents for 10 days on give or take you know, i think it was 10 days and um threw a lot of situations at her you know play we play a tiebreaker this way play a set this way you gotta be creative you know, serve on your hand feed to the back end play the back end approach that's it then you just play a set off of that serve on your hand keep you know you're still playing a set um, I like to tell so kids, okay, I want you to go play. The only shot you can hit top spin on is your serve. And if kids have really extreme grips, then the point is, sorry, you can't play. Yeah. That's a good one. You have no, no variety, no options. options. Yeah. Rolling along, uh, Mr. Hyde. Let's have a look. Uh, it's, it's not where you start. Oh, actually, there's a better one. Um, but I like that one as well. I'll say both. It's not where you start, it's where you finish. And the bigger the dream, the bigger the work ethic. Just notice that with some of the kids here, you know, their goals might be number one player in the world, but they're not putting the work that's needed for that. And that's where they're here with us. Mm, yeah, exactly. Yeah. What are they, they going to do when they go home? With, uh, but no, we'll... We'll share all your notes here. I know you, you said you got to do, do um, a little more work with it. Uh, but as you said, it would be continuous. Um, Chad Burial has spent five years with us. He's won some national championships as a college coach. Uh, I know he has a, a very good notebook. Uh, Dave Anderson has been on the podcast. You, know? you keep adding to it. Mm -hmm. you know, and Then you have a, a manual or a notebook, whatever you want to call it, to give your players. With uh, you're just taking notes as we do this, huh? Yeah, what? yeah. This guy's the intern, always. huh? Always, always. But yeah, if there's you can you can post them, Steve. And if there's anything wrong in them, or if anyone wants to add stuff to them, you just put it in a different color, write in a different color. The um, <laughs> here's a question you had for me. Mark Bay mentioned, uh, what well, you know, it was great to have him on. Loves the game, great passion. And we asked him, he asked young Mark Bay what he thought about or the coaching course that he attended, that I was, I was conducting. And you know, he said some nice things, lots of video work, lots of content, but he just thought it was too restrictive and not enough freedom. And he asked me about that. That's what a lot of people are going to say uh, when they watch our students training. Not too long ago, a college coach, I'm sure I told a story before. It's recent. Went up to one of our students who's been, rec he has been recruited by just about every school in the country. And the coach said, um, who coach, who coaches your son? You know, and I, I'm flattered that, you know, he said, said that I was the, the coach of his son because it's a family that after they came to me, they just did it on their own. They never, never went to a pro or a program after that. And, um, so then the father said to the coach, who was critical, he said, well, no, I, went, I watched, use my name in third person, I watched Steve Smith teach tennis, and uh, there's no way he taught your son how to play. 
And he, he said, well, how long did you watch him teach? He goes, I went for a day. <laughs> and he said, well, this is what it looks like 10 years later. Because it, I mean, somebody that we started working with at age, age eight, and that comes back, we has, you know, everybody can hear that again and again. Uncle Vic is, uh, your players look a little stiff. We let them uh, loosen up after, after nationals. You know, we recommend on a daily basis the, the company on court, off court, showed an offer. I met him years ago when he was on Peter Burwash's staff. And I was out at Dave Anderson's place in Dallas and had a couple of juniors from overseas and we we're training at his place. And um, so he has a, he has a catalog, go to on court, off court, a lot of things you can buy. You want to set up your garage, your basement with teaching aids, go to on court, off court, but he has a clicker for the wrist and on the forehand, if the wrist clicks, that means it's a good forehand. But if you buy that teaching aid with us, you don't want the clicker to click. And that means that you're keeping that wrist fixed. One time on Facebook, um, trying to be a wise guy, I said, I apologize, I was wrong for all these years. This, this film will tell you that you gotta be really wristy on your forehand. And I said, it's a film of Roger Fetter. And it was just high speed film and Roger Fetter's rack is just going like this. I mean, it's not rocket science. The strings have to face the ball. Mm -hmm. Excuse me, the strings have to face the ball. They have to face the contact point. Um, but say, for example, with a fixed wrist on the forehand side, we go out and say, okay, you know, let's have you hit a volley. You know, we're going to hit a conventional approach volley. Um, you know, we get into the forehand, but also, okay, let's hit a top spin lob. And we use Vandermeer progressions, put a ball at the net strap, come up. So loosen your elbow, you can bring the racket up over your shoulder, and then you back up and do it again. And the third time, you actually lean back because when you hit a top spin lob, the angle of the racket is so extreme, it's going not forward, but backwards. And you can actually hit, therefore, hit off your back foot. Um, and Vandermeer is a genius. Um, so many things. Vandermeer, we do that drill. We just call it the Vandermeer. Where you take the racket, you the player goes slow, and they bring it back behind their back. You know, but, um, Becker, who didn't even have a continental grip on the serve. I mean, he um, he definitely had that look. And Sampras, you see posters of Sampras. We put some re originally or recently on Facebook with the Fed, just great base tennis um, Facebook, and. It, the racket looks like it's going in the direction of the baseline. They go so much from left to right, especially on a second serve. With, um, yeah, but the, we'll, we'll get this out, uh, the notes. I mean, I think that's what it really takes. Years ago when I ran this program where you get a two-year degree, um, you, um, we asked people to write notes and then type notes and back in the day, there's no computers, no digitizing. It was uh, put the notes in plastic sheets, and you know, then have a notebook for drills, for singles, for doubles, corrective measures for, you know, volleys. You know, 25 ways to we had a handout, 25 ways to change the kid to from palm down to palm up. Um, tell a story with uh, Craig Tiley's name comes up quite often in his podcast. He was with us for seven years. This is something that we could address at another time, but what's going on with pro tennis and what may happen in 2026, um, uh, Saudi Arabia, um, the, the Sauds, what may happen is just so much more money will come into the, into the game. So Tylee is a leading administrator, but we used to have a test. Tylee was a very organized guy. He had already gone through Stellenbosch. He already been in the army. And then he shows up at our place, and actually we had a um, a tournament. And I didn't play it all the time, but I, we had a tennis tech close. That meant that somebody from the team wasn't going to win it because they had to be in the tennis tech program to be in the tournament. And the team generally had really good players year after year. They were in contention to win nationals. So Tylee's first semester, I played him in the tournament. And there's a lot of rain delays. And I give him the gears. And I said, have you taught tennis before? He goes, yeah. I said, have you accepted money before? Yeah. I said, well, meet me in, a, in four weeks time. 
and you're going to tell people, you're going to be able to tell me that you need to give people a refund. That was true with all the students, like 100%. You know, so many missing tenants. But um, I was sitting in a video class. We're teaching people how to use a video camera. And he was a first year student. I happened to just, I was in charge of the program. I sat down next to him and I just saw his notes. And I said, why don't you just stay in here and teach the next class? So he really jumped ahead with his uh, abilities to help the program because of his organizational skills. And fair enough, he's the CEO of Tennis Australia. But um, with Tylee, we had this lab test. So if you have a, Lawrence, uh, listeners, a, th a three hour lecture class, um, excuse me, a one hour lecture class, one hour lecture class, so you lecture three times a week for 50 minutes, you have three hours to give the test. But well, we had a 15 hour lab. So we had 45 hours to test these lab students and we tested them and uh, it was okay. They would come in small city, Tyler, Texas, and we'd list off 10 things, go, go to your files and bring these 10 back 10 things back in and we'd give them you know, say two hours to do it. And then they had to have a copy of a thank you letter. They had to have a copy of a handout from a visitor. It just had to be super, super organized. And then we wanted him to hand in like a drill notebook, calendar events notebook. Um, but no, what, what you've done, people really need to study tennis. Like say Braden's books. We use his books as textbooks. And I'd be frustrated where students would say, okay, read chapter two. And they just knew by asking for feedback that more than half the class had not read the, the book. So, okay, let's okay now do this and then you know hand in a paper we'll have a test and um but note taking um to hear it's to forget it to write it down to remember it but then to reflect upon it and then repeat do it over and over again let me ask you some questions and you can ask some questions um i think you're clear on that with mark bay though as far as you know like we tell people if we tell them to stop here we do, that's because we're it's evaluating is the swing yeah, of, yeah. is the swing a vertical lift is the wrist fixed you have a long hitting zone and if you tell people to shake hands like an eight-year-old shake hands with a giant um that means you're going to slow down here mm. but it's so so important to write you have the right fundamentals yeah. and then you don't want the player when they start to play you don't want them to slow down yeah but initially from a learning standpoint and i think that I think that carries over from any um, task where it's skill acquisition. I think one of the best ones for that, because for me, I played a lot with, with the wrist, especially in the forehand one, both sides. But just that as a corrective measure, like you're saying, where you get kids to stop up high and it just helps you keep the wrist solid as well, rather than floating it behind your back. But yeah, like you said, it's, correct, it's just a lot of corrective measures, right? And then it just, once you get it, you can... Yeah. Progress. Uh, Dave Anderson at his place, a little, a little bit of forehand and go up and just hit and just have them take, take the record to their left hand and go way up high. That's a good one as well. Yeah. Um, it's very common for players to pull across. I have a, a junior here who um, has obviously played quite a bit of tennis and we say, okay, point the racket down the line, point the racket across court from the baseline. And then typically what she did, like others, she points to the court next to her. And then also players don't get the racket below the ball. So they see their target through the net. They think the tennis court is gigantic. So they definitely have that merry-go-round swing. But you have to do so many things uh, to, to get people to swing vertically. Um, one great teaching is to have a ball machine and have kids hit against the ball machine. And this racket has no strings. You said that. That's, yeah. And then it's just really because they're not looking uh they're not looking at that flyaway ball. Mm. Like, oh, where'd the ball go? Yeah. But um, how about, let's go with Spencer Johnson. You saw it maybe a half dozen times where we uh, made videos for him just on matches. Sometimes we did it live. Sometimes we did it after the match was over. What comes to your mind from that as far as learning standpoint? Um, I think... Um I think probably one of the biggest things, because we've seen a couple of college matches, but just the fact that he's wanting to get better. So you're making these videos for him, and then it seems like he's actively looking to make these changes, whereas 
I think the other day we went to Virginia and you said there was a, a guy that had a good player but he brought the racket low on the backhand and you said to me, you said, a guarantee, well not guarantee, but there's a good chance he'll be there for four years and that, it won't, that won't change. Yeah. Um, and I think they've won six of the last 10 years with men's team we're just watching them practice. And uh, live and let live. Uh, one thing that makes tennis the way it is, is like say Bjorn Borg going way back years ago, you know, he had a reset swing on the backhand, took it low, brought it back up high. And as a result, he stood way behind the baseline in the ad court when McEnroe came along as a lefty. He had a very effective serve into uh, Borg's backhand. Um, but yeah, day one. Um, of course, you know, if I was coaching college tennis, I'd go to the old school and I'd have all freshmen red shirt. I just know because years ago, that's the way it was. Um, you know, even the very elite players, you know, just, okay, you're going to take, they all say they want to play pro tennis, basically, more so with the boys. And I think parents, um, I told some parents this just the other day, you were in the room, top college coaches, let me say that way, that's not, that's not fair because there's only top college coaches that are coaching D3. The players that are playing at these Power Five conferences with, um, they want to play pro tennis. 12 months is nothing. You know, and if they have holes in their game, say, for example, they want to be a complete player and they want to, they're going to play doubles. You know, we're going to have you take a red shirt year. You do everything the team does but play matches, but we're not going to play one. We're not going to play one match where we play one up, one back. That doesn't mean that, okay, there's not the exception to the rule, but, you know, very, very sexist, very chauvinistic. The girls, um, I know this is a review, and a lot of people have told us that we need to go back and review grips and swings and body balance and everything that we did in the beginning of these podcasts. But uh, second five years of a 10-year project, Chad Burial, um, you know, he came in and um, he, he needed to be trained. He eventually had autonomy, but at first, you know, we had, you know, like any anybody like yourself coming in is that, you know, it's not to insult anyone, but okay, this 12 year old's here. We've known him for five years. He's got a better handle on tennis information. But straight across the board, when girls would leave the program, junior college program, I think it was four out of five years they were in the finals, only win one once. And every last one of them was told they had to stay back in doubles. Now, you and I were at that women's match. I still would say, no, we're just coming. Because we're playing a six. How ridiculous is that? Not even divisible by four. Oh, the point is so important. Mm. But someone's there for four years. Say, this is how we're doing it. But they weren't even coming in on short balls, like slow short balls. They yeah. Were electing to stay back. Lisa Raymond. Um, she should be the 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 go-to for college women's, not just women's tennis, but men's tennis. You know, she plays, as it's been said, she plays real doubles. The Bryan brothers called her money at the University of Florida. Her name came out. We talked about the lady, Andy Brandy. Um, serve and volley. You have to have two things to be a serve and volley or a serve and a volley. Um, if you don't serve volley, you don't serve volley. Johnson, though, you're staying in the pocket. Um, you know, so many people are moving laterally. They're, say, a right-hander. They have most right-handers have a very tough time moving to the right to uh, get a forehand. Um, it uh, Gonzalez Austin, a friend of my son Connor's, Kalamazoo. I never said a word to Gonzalez, but my son Connor started coaching him. Connor went to college at Florida State the summer before, so he hadn't been playing much tennis. I think it was something that Florida State did that was very good is have kids get on campus and get used to uh, college life, um, college classes. So I say that because a lot of kids go to a national tournament, they lose and they don't play the backdrop. I said to Connor, I said, hey, we'll just stay here for the three, three remaining days. And it was in the 16th. And um, Colette Lewis does a really good job with zoo tennis. She uh, mentioned that Dallas Austin faint Connor because he won the won Kalamazoo and he played um, Jack Sock and Jack Sock's screaming, I can't believe I'm losing to Gonzalez Austin. And I said, hey, he hits a kick serve, stay in early. 
you know, obviously he got bigger, stronger, but he just threw the ball too far as a right to the left. That's just a, it's just a gimme. We did the same thing with uh, Vicky Duval playing Stozer at the U.S. Open. I mean, she won the U.S. Open and uh, tosses way over the head. Well, the ball's going to bounce up high. Take it early. Famous story about um, Ted Schroeder. I taught tennis with his son, Rick Schroeder. Ted won Wimbledon. A hotshot junior comes up. He's really arching the back, tossing way over his head. And he serves. And Schroeder goes in, gets down on one knee. People used to go to the net so much, like a Chuck McKinley would do that. They, the balls up, you take the shot, generate the most racket at speed. Well, it's an overhead. McKinley would get down on one knee. So this, the junior comes up, he feet, he's playing against Ted Schroeder, tosses his way over the head. The ball kicks up. Schroeder, on the return serve, gets down one knee, hits an over, said, hey, kid, you can't serve that way here. Steve Denton, I'll have to go back to my train of thought, but Steve Denton did that one time. He was playing doubles with Kevin Curran. They're playing against Agassi and Krikstein. I can't remember which one it was, but they pretty much both you know, had reliable first and second serves they were getting a lot of free points off their serves and Denton just caught the ball they were younger coming up he just caught the ball intimidated them and he said you're not really going to serve that way are you <laughs> did it in the match but coming back to uh jack sock is make him move to his right he's always moving to his left you know and that's something with coming back to johnson um and again I was all for him going on this mission. He didn't play for two years. He didn't play for two years. And he surprised a lot of people, I think, on the coaching. I mean, I know on the coaching staff and teammates that, that he's playing. Um, yeah, it's always about getting better. It's always getting better. Get you know, criticism should be your juice. Um, what do you think of the Virginia facility? Yeah, it's incredible. Amazing, huh? Yeah, well, we've been in both, well, gone there. The front way, haven't we? And then last week we went there the back way, and yeah, just just the whole the whole complex is incredible. Oh, the homes, the houses, and, but yeah, inside, outside the courts, yeah, it's a lovely. Yeah, those beautiful houses. My mother might say, place. "I wonder what the butler's doing." The uh, the kids must be inside playing with the butler. <laughs> beautiful homes, but yeah, in some ways it's like, whoa, this place is too fancy. Beautiful outdoor stadium. And then yeah. Indoors. It's at a resort. It's at a resort. Got a lot of banners up. Um, Daniel Collins, uh, University of Virginia, won the title twice, just won a uh, turn in Miami. But we work with so many players that want to play junior tennis. As the parents, they need to take their kids to watch a college match. It's not easy to get there. Coming back to Wayne Bryan's letter, um, his letter, he states very strongly that um, American college tennis should be for American kids. It, both men and women were over 60% last year, but I, I like the comment where we just have to get better. We just have to get better. Um, it's not just tennis. Uh, Nick Saban said 83% coach from Alabama just retired football coach, Lawrence. 83% of all medal winners in the last Olympics had trained at an American university. How about the high school kids that came out? Yeah, I only saw them once, actually. But, uh, but yeah, good, good kids. They watched the final, didn't they, with us as well, the Indian Wells final. But, yeah, good kids. One comment to make, and I know Ivano Soretz does so much for, for us. Um, the, the junior kid versus a high school kid the junior kid is perhaps that's a problem itself playing 12 months out of the year just playing tennis only tennis and um you know and i understand clearly the the and i push those buttons because you know, i have the kids you know say gratitude three times and do they really appreciate what their parents are doing for them it's uh I heard a tennis parent say one time, it's like, like you have $100 bills falling out of your pocket. You know, from the baseball cap to the to the headband, down to the, the, sh the shoes and socks. It's just great, great expenses. Um, but you can just sense how they make changes easier because 
you, you talk to them and say, like, yeah, okay. And it's, there's not that fear of getting worse. It's like, hey, you want to get better? This is what you need to do. And they're saying, like, yeah, okay. Um, we tell people all the time, if the only time we're going to work within someone's game is if they're well on their way. You know, they're a top 10 kid in the country. They're going to definitely get a scholarship. Then we say, okay, we can work within your game. Um, with uh, Austin Krychek playing doubles with Dojic, a forehand grip on his serve. Well, he's 39 years old. Does he have to change his grip? But if he were just to turn his hand in like this, just to cup the racket. My son played, became an All-American with a, a young guy who had a palm-up serve. He was a Kalamazoo junior doubles champion. And really good athlete, great competitor. My son used to say to him, Cobra, Cobra, to get the hand in this position. I heard Paul McDonald say this one time where if you've coached someone for a long time, it's very easy to um, reflect and have stories about that junior player. One thing is adrenaline helps memory. And I certainly, people tell you I have a very good memory. I tease and say I have total recall. I recall totally what I want to. But this list of 20 players that are here, um, I like to tell people they're the author of their own story. One of our parents, he says to kids, he goes, How's this movie going to play out? How's the movie going to play out? So obviously we don't want to go player by player, but um, just this list in front of you, yeah, we can share it. Um, without using their name, tell me what do you think of number one? Did you get it? Yeah, uh, number one. Yeah, good, good kid, really nice kid. His strokes, the technique, phenomenal. Very good. Just, uh, just thought the physicality. Uh, probably lacking a, a little bit, but yeah, strokes were very easy on the eye. Good, yeah, good strokes both hands as well, which was phenomenal to see. He, you know, not just shadowing, but he could hit with his weaker hand. High, highest form of retention for learning is to teach. We teach everyone to teach. Really, the player needs to become the coach, and then the coach is the compass. Uh, you know, he has been part of what we do for four years. And also, too, it's not a matter of just educating the player, it's educating the parent um, with uh, reflective thoughts. Um, how about number two? Yeah, so he was here at the same time as number one. Yeah, again, very nice kid. Um, yeah, good strokes. He, um, I wonder if at that age, what he was... 17. Uh, yeah, 17. I know a lot goes on at that age, you could tell. I don't know, maybe if there was a little bit like anxiety, a bit of nervousness, maybe. I don't know. There's a lot going on at that age. You know, they're trying to work out their place in the world, maybe. So, I don't know. But yeah, great kid. And I know he's he's wanting to go to a college, right? He's wanting to play yeah, college so tennis. He could definitely play college tennis, but generally, especially uh, Americans, Canadians too. Um, want to play it at a brand school. They want to play it at a name school. Anxiety. You actually wrote a school, wrote a paper, school assignment, anxiety. The feeling of fear, the feeling of self-doubt. If he could just play. But how he came, one of our passionate coaches told him, <clears throat> and I've known this player for a number of years now, he said, you don't know the content. It's amazing how many players don't study the content. Uh, and he's, he's again, my name in third person is not Steve Smith stuff. I mean, they just, it, it, I, I took two, two players over to what we call the tennis house, eight bedrooms, eight bathrooms and, and left practice and say, okay, you guys do this, this and this. And I've got to go do a couple of things on the phone, on the computer. And he took two players that, um, really should have already gone through the course of great base initiative. So we had a two hour study hall and they went through the course, but they had not watched one clip. Now watch one clip with, um, how about your, uh, number three coach who came in with you? Yeah. Yeah. My classmate. Classmate. Yeah, he, um, I think he arrived the same day I arrived. He was here about three, four days. Yeah. And, um, yeah, they were, remember those first few days, it was sort of like what, nine, 10 hour days we were doing a lot yeah. of stuff on court and yeah, we, uh, yeah. 
He's a what's it? College coach. <laughs> High school coach. High school coach. But he's yeah. keen. He's 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 playing himself. Mm. It's very important for coaches to uh, be able to demonstrate. So when we train a coach, first thing we do is is we film them. They don't have to go through. We would film running and throwing and rallying and playing points, but to uh, just film their strokes. Now with him, he's very fit. He's yeah, he's playing. He's playing competitive tennis. Um, a lovely guy as well. Very laid back. You know what laid back means? What? Almost dead. <laughs> no, I says that's my definition. I shouldn't say that. that's a definition I stole from someone. Well, easy going. I'd say Chill, easy going. composed. Yeah. That word. yeah. Has things in perspective. Mm. Um, yeah, it's like anything, you know, it's, it's, it's how you, how do you describe that word? Um, yeah, I hope it'd be good to check in with him actually. I hope, you know, that's what about four weeks ago now. So I'd be interested to see where he is. Yeah, for sure. Development. For sure. With, uh, you know, players can send us an updated film. Um, he's actually coaching a high school team. We talked about, you know, we plan on doing that, uh, after the summer is contacting potential hosts for workshops and travel places and do workshops. The, um, here's another one. Yep. Can you just stay with me on this here? Yeah. We should be more organized, but. Which one? Right under. Under the high school kids. Yeah, right under that. <laughs> legend, absolute, absolute legend. Just, yeah, funny kid. This is super, super funny kid. Good strokes. Um, aware of the fairies a little bit at times. He was one of the kids, you could just watch him. He doesn't even mean to be funny, but just, I don't know, just his mannerisms. Yeah, really lovely kid. I don't know how um, how serious he takes his, <laughs> takes his tennis, but was he, was the, he liked his um, bagels as well, wasn't it? Peanut butter Peanut bagels. Peanut butter and bagels. Was it before that meal? He was going for a meal. I think you told him not to have a bagel. <laughs> he had a bagel and he had something else. No, no, it? yeah, we went out to a nice restaurant. Ron told him as well. You both told him. Yeah, no, he was ready to eat some peanut butter cookies. He said, no, don't, don't eat those peanut butter cookies. No. So I come back, he's making a peanut butter sandwich. But a growing kid, but um, you hear Lawrence say, I mean, they're all good kids. But yeah. With, with uh, He hit the ball really well. Mm. And But he was sent here, um, character. You know, he was just said, he was just, we were just told, try to get this guy, he's 11 years old, and he's been trained in the system since he was six. It hits the ball extremely well. But as Vic Brady would say, he's going to have to call a cab to get to the ball, you know, <laughs> with uh, the running side of it. Yeah. Here, here's a family. Here's two. I guess I can write them here so you can. Yeah. It'll be easier for you to see it. I think I might know. Yeah. Brother and sister. I oh, know. So you see this? I could write a book on um, both of them, volumes. Uh, who, who's that? Can't read my, my can't, read, it, can't no. read my chicken scratch. Can't read the handwriting. They had schools in England, don't they? Well, uh, not very good ones. <laughs> oh, sure they do. Um, Actually, I went to I went to a prep school in New England, uh, yeah. and it was. Uh, they don't even. Those two don't look. <laughs> this is sister. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah. Um, brother, sister. Yeah. So the brother, just, yeah, what I remember about him, just wanted to hit the ball. Just loud to wind up and just doing like the drop feeds and he's just teeing off. Yeah. With that, with that, you have a better chance of having the racket face be vertical to hit by swinging fast and slow. The one ball blast is better than the forever push. Um, and being much younger than his sister, sister thought of season said, no, no, no. He said, and my mother used to say that if you could put all your kids and all their characteristics in one bag and just shuffle up the bag and they had the best of each other. Um, but that's definitely for something the sister could take. You know, like he wants to crack the serve. Yeah. Excuse me. He wants to, as we say, take a rip at it. Um, and the sister, Sister, yeah. Um, we spoke a little bit, haven't we, about the sister? I think, again, like we said, they're all, all lovely kids. I think for her, did you say very much a, a feeler? Was it? 
Uh, we always, for, their, for, for our, the for our listeners, you go to one of the podcasts on brain typing, Myers-Briggs, um, thinkers are feelers and feelers are thinkers. You're both. One's your primary, one's your secondary. Um, I think almost all young kids come across as a feeler because they have the curse. They want to win. Mm. They can't think their way through. People aren't, people aren't going to say think on your feet. And with that, um, she, she seemed to freeze a little bit when she was playing when they say the so-called pressure was put on, you could see that freezes a bit, a bit of anxiety, yeah, yeah, you know, if, a bit. A bit, a bit of anxiety, a bunch of anxiety. It just switches off. It just sort of overwhelms her. It the like the word freeze, that's great to hear that. Uh, the, the juniors, you know, do they have a library card? Do they, do they read autobiographies? Pete Sampras, the junior should be assigned that. And there's a difference between freezing and choking. Mm. For the longest time, I didn't realize choking is positive. You know, you just get nervous. Everybody gets nervous. So Jim Lehrer's competitive cycle, um, it's just TAC, it's T-A-C-C. -C. You're in the center of the circle, you're challenged, not threatened. And then as you get away from the ideal performance state, then you choke, heart rate goes up. People don't like to choke, then they get angry, frustrated uh, first. And then they, they tank. So it looks like this. Yeah, that's a, a moral. That lets me know that we didn't cover that. We, you have to come back. So it's, it's a challenge choke it's anger and then tank mm. and um but choking yeah your heart rate goes up you're nervous but some people just freeze it's deer in headlights and they just can't compete they got bobby the late bobby riggs would say you got to get in the game you got to play um you know safe serve and volley is you got to do it early in the match you can't wait to crunch time you know to get a net appearance you know, it's very, it's, people just think I'm doom and gloom, but you can, I mean, it's amazing. You know, yeah, you've played tennis five years and you haven't served volleyed one time. You go to a tournament, the chances of you hitting an overhead are slim and none, and slim just left town. With, but all the situational training, the, the, uh, the older player went to a tournament afterwards, and it was a compromise. She did, you know, I, I got a report, I have eyes everywhere. <laughs> because juniors I work with that are at tournaments, they don't realize they get feedback. Um, just, you know, every, I mean, every weekend, basically, people, people can just, it's a, it comes from Arthur Ashe. Arthur Ashe said about um, his roommate, his best man, Charlie Passarelli, said about Welby Van Horn students, as you can tell them a mile away. Well, you can tell great base students a mile away. And I don't take that as a compliment. It's just like, whoa, tennis is not that well taught. Uh, then also, too, just because you have pretty strokes. A lot of times the kid with character and fight. And another thing, too, is that if you're teaching people to play all over the court, go forward, they're going to improve at a, a slower rate. Um, but coming back to freezing, so it goes off to a tournament and gives a report that she serves in volleys 90% of the time on the first serve and none on the second time. Well, that's where we, where we tennis coaches are like parents. We have no consequences. You know, the, I used to tease, you know, the parents, um, is your, your mother going to make you sleep in the garage if you lose this match? No food this week if you lose this match? So the kids have unconditional love, and they know the parents will get upset, expectations, disappointments. And the coach as well, but they know the storm will pass. But it just has to, again, be principle-based. to just serve and go. You're not going to develop instincts to go forward. I mean, it's 14, you know, now it's first year 16, 16 in our national tournament. Um, so many things. Uh, Alvin, where are you? Daughter got to be 28 in the world and won Wimbledon doubles with Davenport, played two national tournaments. And he said, this is always reinforcement, he said, no one cares who wins a weekend tournament in Miami. Play the right way. Um, you know, in other sports, uh, I should say in other endeavors, you know, a kid is like our, our piano player. He stops, he makes a mistake, and he keeps on going. Now, we're at a level where we can't even, we can't even tell if he makes a mistake. That's how good he is. Yeah. Yeah. But um, the figure skater falls down. You know, they train for four years for the Olympics. They hit, the, they hit one bad edge or the kid falls off the balance beam. Uh, tennis really allows for mistakes. 
you know, you can lose first at six love. You're only down one love in the game, played to two. Um, with uh, just comments in general, I don't think we've really done this before. This one, yeah, uh, yeah, sweet kid. She'd been to. Guess I not feel sorry, but just have a bit of um, what's the word? Compassion for a dad that had been to what seven or eight academies previously to come to you and you could just see the frustration factor for him uh, just just realizing that i guess less so the money but the time that they'd wasted going to the other places and then yeah coming here yeah she seemed to enjoy it and he was he was very pleased wasn't he with it yeah it seems with um the video work that we've done i have um worked as a consultant many academies, run academies, visit academies, observe academies. And say, for example, someone's been in an academy you know, five years. It's not really fair to the academy, though, if someone has only been there for a week. You know, it's just the assembly yeah. line. They've been there for a week. Now, what we do is high maintenance. It's labor intensive. We're going to film people, skill test people, and go to work. You're not just going to be a number going through, going through the lines, hitting balls. Um, but say, for example, someone's been in an academy for five years and, um, I was visiting an academy one time and it was, it was because there was a tournament at the academy and then an intern with me and I said, well, there's four private lessons going over there. All four players in the private lesson have palm up serves and just see what they're teaching them. And, you know, like one is, um, Telling them to toss over the head, arch the back. Another one is, you know, the, the pinpoint stance. And, you know, teaching someone who has a palm up serve, a pinpoint stance, that's like buying furniture for a house that doesn't have a roof. Uh, and it's just, but they don't see it, yeah. you know. Uh, once you see it, you can't unsee it. Um, but I think another thing with all these players, not this, this one in particular, is miles on the legs. Yeah, yeah. You know, we, we have people go through the spider test, the, the beep test, the 12 minute run. And, you know, European kids, they're going to show up with uh, running shoes. Also, the South American, European kid, Asia as well, is they're going to have played loads of pickup soccer. Yeah, I think and, um, we, we've uh, a lot on those lists. I think that applies to a lot of them, just don't have the miles on their legs. and. You know, coming from England and growing up, you know, you, you well, in my generation, we played a lot of sport outside all the time. So you just get used to running around and that sort of thing. Uh, you read that? Yeah, yeah. She, she uh, actually, I'd say, was probably more athletic than some of the others. Um, what else about her? Very loud. <laughs> Very Personality. Loud. Yeah, yep. big, so, big. So, something for juniors. I told the junior this today. Um, and this is, uh, an updated list. Talk slow, mm. talk softly. And, you know, you, you know, when kids get together and, and they're just so excited, just calm down, take a chill pill. Um, but that's where we, when you go through the brain typing, so an extrovert, extrovert who talked to a tree is, the extrovert needs to act like an introvert, but the introvert needs to act like the like an extrovert. Um, we talked about one of these other players. And when you house a player 24-7 and they just go straight to their room, and you're like, where did they go? They retreated. They got away. Um, with um, this, here's one. I'll, I'll add to this. I heard the great Tom Brady say this about his own kid one time. So here's the name. Yeah. The Oscar goes to? <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah. I recall that. Very, uh, very dramatic when he was doing the 12-minute 12, 12 run. Yeah, to film their facial expressions, I mean, you, you would think that we're torturing them. Mm. Run 12 minutes, try not to stop, run as many laps as you can. It, for him, you could tell he, did, he didn't have the miles on his legs at all. Yeah. He? But, you know, I get a report from, from the mom and... If the toughest step is the first step out the door. Most young tennis kids don't have uh, 
um, a running program. And we tell people all the time, and then we say, did you do it? You know, with, um, on our um, YouTube channel, you could find a hundred different exercises. Johan Fruling, a German trainer, he's on an internship, uh, he's getting his uh, master's at St. Leo. They're number one in the country right now. And he's a fitness coach, but he's just circumstantial. Chad Berryhill left that school and now is coaching at Emory Riddle. Um, but just the expression on a kid's faces, so he, he, he was the worst, so he got the best. You know, you, you're the best actor. Um, but the thing is, is he hadn't, he played, he's played some tennis, but he only worked with one of our coaches for a couple months. Very bright kid. Yeah. And he understands the discipline from a musical instrument and from academics. Uh, it, it comes down to the attitude of the household. I tell parents, I mean, why don't you, um, why don't you go for a walk? You walk and have the kid run backwards next to you. And then just, or you, we're going to go for three miles. And if you have to walk, you have to walk, but we're going to go three miles. You know, I'm going to, I'm going to listen to a pod, the, the adult, I'm going to listen to a podcast. I'm going to make some phone calls, but we're going three miles and we're going to clock it. And at first, if we just walk, if they just walk the whole time, they really have to rehab. And one time I had two Russian trainers working with us and they were running a fitness program. We did it for I think, two years. And I said, just have one word that defines what you're going to do. They wanted overnight to think about it. They came up with one word, obedience. You got to obey your own goals. And so that everybody listening, we have juniors write down what's your goal. And quite often, we had a little eight-year-old write down, I want to get the ball in. It's so much better to say, you know, I want to have great strokes. There's some positives of a kid going, I want to be number one in the world. Um, the... Uh, I don't know if this is a name you can read, my writing. But yeah, the young girl you just mentioned, uh, it's uh, so yeah. important you got to be able to run. So she could run. You know, I like to tell people you got to run, hit, and compete. And that comes from Chuck Creasy. With mind, mobility, and mechanics. You know, it all comes down to four parts of tennis. The, you have the mentally emotional, the technical, the tactical, the physical. It starts with the mentally emotional. Um, you know, can you read this name? Yeah, yeah. My chicken yeah. trash? Yeah. Thoughts? Well, yeah, interesting one. <laughs> interesting one. I, I, I think for me with, with him, it was just realizing that, so he's, well, he'd come, what, once a month or a week every month and just, I didn't see any tape beforehand. We, we have it. We document it. We have the first film. First time I met him, but just the fact that he came back and just some technical issues or just with the grips, I guess. And you saying to me that when he left, you know, it was it, oh, it was looking good. And then he come back and it was some of it was way off. Oh, and, and with, uh, with, uh, with everyone, when they come back to our program, you know, we want to film them the first day they come back. Mm. And, you know, we made a tape. Uh, not only him, but for everyone, you have to do the routines. I think that's, that's that's a good example of that one of not doing the, like you said, the routines, not doing the right thing. Yeah, you've got to do the hard yards where it's not a matter of just hitting balls. No. And um, you're better off to hit 10 balls the right way in a, a really young player. 10 balls the right way, 1,000 balls the wrong way. At the same time, though, you're doing other things to become athletic. Um I think that would help him as well to do other things, other sports. I think would help. Yeah, the athleticism. With uh, he's an athletic kid actually. He's a strong kid for for his age. No, if if you start the course and stay the course, I'm very confident that they're going to stay the course. Yeah. Um, if you take it, if you if, if people take a deep dive into the great base, very good chance they'll stay the course. I mean, but very few do. And I'm talking about the parents, parents. I mean, we have some parents that recommend read this book and they've read the book, you know. Um, here we go. Uh -huh. 
Oh, what can I say? <laughs> um, good strokes, but physicality, probably one of the worst I've, I've seen for someone of that age. And um, yeah, I think it goes back to that quote, if you can't run, you can't play. And yeah, and yeah. Yeah, there's yeah. I don't know what else to say really about. about but, you know, to connect the dots is that when when they make when they make that choice. Uh, but I think it's great with um, you know the the parents to and the coaches not never to give up, you know, never yeah. to give up. And from as far as professional pride, um, you know, we have some. Well, let's just have you toss them. We toss them some balls, and people go, "Whoa, he can hit balls." Mm -hmm. And um, I, I think that's. Just to interject, Steve, I think that's one of the things I've, well, I've learned many things that, that, you know, never give up on the kid because a, a kid like that, you could be like, well, he's not interested. So, you know, see you later or whatever. But, but yeah, but I like that, you know, never give up on the kid. But also too, we have to come back. It's very important. Recreational tennis, recreational tennis and competitive tennis, the strokes are the same. Yeah. The strokes are the same. The pace of the lesson or the intensity is different mm. and what his parents have given him is he has a tennis game where he can play the rest of his life. Yeah. He, sure. he, he still, he hasn't, he hasn't selected, even though it, of all these kids on the list, we've known him the longest. He hasn't chosen the path. Or he has, let me get this correct. He's chosen the path of least resistance. Yeah. And I think that's where with parenting, not in this particular case, but parenting in general, most parents, they don't realize that they cancel each other out. That's in our brain typing opposites attract. And the kid works becomes a master manipulator. They work, work one parent against the other one. They, they take, we'll take the easy road versus the hard road. Yeah. So that's why I'm always telling parents to, if you're going to disagree, uh, that's fine, but don't disagree in front of your kid. You know, the kid is like watching a ping pong ball go back and forth. And then they start to formulate their opinions. It's very difficult too. If parents are getting in the car, mom and dad are talking, you know, they're reviewing what, what was, was the tennis camp? Was the tennis lesson? Was it worth it? And they share their opinions back and yeah. forth. Um, if he were to read about Roger Federer, um, there was a lot of silence where the parents were talking, it was silent car ride, or, you know, Roger, they, they weren't talking, so he knows he messed up. Yeah. And um, I, I really, really think the, the backstory, the story of character is much more powerful, much, a much greater significance than, than technique. Um, hey, another player. Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah, lovely kid. He worked really hard. Just put his head down and, and got, got on with everything. Um, quite, um, quite shy though, I'd say. I think, you know, when we went back, like you said, you, you learn a lot when you live with people. So you, I didn't really see him. You go back to the house and he seemed to just disappear. Yeah, twenty four seven into his room. But great kid. Yeah, shyness really, is really a fear. Nice kid. Shyness is fear. One thing that's gone away. The parents. He was very quiet, wasn't he? Didn't, didn't yeah. Talk, didn't talk too much. Um, what's gone away here in the states is children don't introduce themselves to adults. They don't greet adults. And it's even even now we're with last names. Um, you know, we as coaches in the U.S. You know, my, for myself is. It's not a matter of, you know, say your last name's Hyde, surname is the junior should be coming up and say, nice to meet you, Mr. Hyde, or Coach Hyde. Or they could say Coach Lawrence. They shouldn't say Lawrence. Mm. And, um, but it has to work at it. We talk about how volunteers years ago, they would have uh, fake press conferences. Like, hey, we know you're going to be great. This is how you're going to deal, deal with the media. And, you know, I think that's, I've done that with players, player visiting and say, okay, every time there's an adult that walks in this indoor center, you're going to finish up with the drill you're on. I'll, I'll just give you the signal. If not, you'll, you'll, you, you should do it on your own accord. Is you just leave the court and go introduce yourself to the people who came in. Mm. And I mean, they, if they're frozen on that, and, you know, coming back to worse than, worse than choking, they're just locked. Because you want to get them over stage fright. You know, we have 
players, okay, sing happy birthday. I just go, hey, so-and-so's happy birthday. So so-and-so's birthday, it's not. They sing happy birthday, and then they just start right away. Happy birthday. And they start, they look around and they refuse to do it. You know, tell a story. Um, actually thinking of Austin Krychek, uh, Andy Roddick used to do this Davis Cup. Is every player had to get up and say a few words. You know, there'd be a, a dinner with the host team, the visiting team, and you know, they might get three words, you know, one of them might be pancakes. And they have to get up and they're giving their speech and it's going to be short. They just stand up and say a few words and, you know, it's like, just get through it. Just put your head yeah. down and get through it. Uh, play, playing the prank. Um, here's another name for you. Um, yeah. <laughs> yeah. No, I guess, yeah. Another one with not too many miles on his, on his legs. Nice kid. That was really nice as well. I think, you know, for him, well, he'd, he'd already spent, what do you say, four to five years with someone that that you had um, coached so who, who was teaching him the, the technique. But then when he came here, yeah, there was a few inefficiencies, right? It was Well, there's a f for this, this young man, he had more miles on the legs. Um, you know, I tell people, hey, you're here. It should be a life-changing experience. You're here with your father. When you go home, your mother's going to go, what happened? Mm. You know, it should be 180. What happens when people come here to visit, the parents will tell me, yeah, it was, it was fine when they first came back, but it, it wore off. The, the newfound approach to becoming a better, a better player. I think what, one thing with him as well is that it did seem like with the dynamic that he was the prince. And I think you asked him a question as well. Oh, yeah, yeah. I ask kids every day. You live in a castle? <laughs> so um, I think he's on top of the pyramid at, at home, maybe. No, I think for parents listening, uh, you know, kids don't, for the most part, they don't do household chores anymore. Um, you know, I understand. I think the biggest reason is the, the parents going, go do your homework, go do your homework, go study more, go study more. And they, I mean, all you got to do is hand a kid a broom and just know that they've never swept before. Well, in what, four to five weeks in the house, don't know if I've, if I've seen one kid come up to me or, you know, go up to you or Ivan and say, can I help? Can I do something? Can I clear up? That's, I don't think so. No. Maybe, you, maybe the two at the beginning, you know, the first two on the list, right, right at the beginning. Yeah. Maybe those two. I only saw them right at the end. I'd imagine those two probably would, but the rest. Well, they have to be trained. You know, I'd say my fault first with, from other countries, you know, in the US of A, no. I mean, most tennis kids, it's unfortunate, they don't work part-time jobs. Tennis is very demanding and they play 12 months out of the year. Um, one thing though that people have to re realize is that, this comes up with this player as well, is that um, the, um, I've already, if I've known them four or five years, they come in and people go, oh, I can't believe he's talking to that kid that way. But I've known them for four or five years. And it's like, okay. But here's something else is when people would come to visit, we, we can actually film them. And we, we've done that since you've been here. So we've done it for years in the past. Okay, just demonstrate your strokes. Just shout us with your strokes. We'll film that. Then we'll feed you balls. And then I'll just come. You, you're such a phony. I mean, you, you demonstrate such efficient volleys, for example, and we film you. You're not even close. So we'll come back to Gloria Connors and Jimmy Connors. Jimmy used to always say, I'm going to play the way I'm taught to play. You know, we have a system. It's a system of systems. And yeah, that ball is floating up in the air like a wounded duck. Go in and play a conventional approach volley. Obviously, you got to let the ball come down, take those uh, quick stutter steps, adjustment steps. So the ball, the racket's going to be vertical, and you can just tag, tag that approach volley. That's a lost art. But you're, told to, you're told to do it from the get-go. Um, the, uh, I think also too is accountability, accountability. And then also, I mean, I go back to my time in a Catholic school, Catholic church, Catholic upbringing, guilt and manipulation. You know, you're waiting, you're wasting your time, but you're also wasting the coach's time, your parents' money. Okay. This young man. Yeah. The piano man. Piano man. Yeah. Inc incredible, incredible skill in the piano. L lovely kid, good strokes. 
And um, yeah, granddad, granddad was a professional footballer, a semi-professional footballer. Just, just seemed lovely. Just uh, yeah, the granddad and the, the grand. Uh, well, one thought for our listeners: this particular player coming to visit, known him a number of years. He plays nice tennis. He's going to always be able to play club tennis. But to go, he's still young at twelve to go beyond that. He still could. But what is difficult for some of our students is they go other places and people want to change their strokes. So the parents are stuck as a well. We took them to this program and they want to you know, change them from a seriously from an Eastern grip to a Western grip. Really want to have them chop downward on volleys. Um, you know, I think that's where the parent, they're writing the check. They should be able to, uh, they should be able to talk to the turn, the, the director and say, well, you know, we're following this pathway. We have a, a private coach or this is, this is the approach we're taking. We'd like to be here for service and we you know, want to be respectful, you know, for drills and match play. And you can do that. Um, with, uh, I've done that before where I'm in, in a position where I'm teaching private lessons and, uh, you know, different stages of my career. I remember going to Tampa to get started. I just, I was just doing privates initially and it takes a while to do the video work and what have you and say, well, no, you can, you can still go places and hit lots of balls. As you do that though, don't go through those move up, move downs where you want to win. You know, you, they say, for example, you have too big backswing on your forehand. Focus on that while you're drilling. Focus on that while you're playing. Now, here's a player who's just here for two days. Yeah, her um, athleticism stood out. She would played a lot of soccer, I believe, and you could just tell her her build was strong. She reminded me a little bit of you know the girls we saw at um, the college matches. There was a couple of them that were just solid, and she was... She was solid, and I think it just shows you the importance of playing other sports as well. Because the two girls that are here at the moment, they play lots of other sports. You, you can just tell the difference. You just see, um, just physique-wise, you can you can tell that they're stronger, and then therefore able to probably endure more on the court. Um, I, in two days, made a guess is ISTP, uh, great brain type for tennis. Um, with the animal kingdom, mm. listeners, you can have um, juniors, coaches, players, parents. You can look at uh, a YouTube clip called Animal Kingdom for stretching, animal kingdom exercises. You know, the flamingo, the duck, the spider, the monkey, but the just the frog, just a standstill jump to yeah. the net. Yeah, yeah. And, um, you know, so we had a number of 12-year-olds and, you know, one, tell, one 12 year old is getting up there in five jumps, and another one's getting up there in nine jumps. <laughs> and then you tell the juniors, go in your driveway and do this. You know, the only way to get better, piano man, the only way to get better at piano is play piano. The only way to get better at jumping is jumping. Um, with, uh, but in two days, you do a pre post. Now, one of our students, um, center here, I mean, she had a toss that was bringing down icicles. I mean, and then the palm, uh -huh. yeah, the palm, yeah. palm is way up, and that's why it's so important to um, to film it. Um, so important to film, and then say, okay, if you follow our program to the nth degree, when you work on your serve, you read that. Yeah, that's the whole one. Yeah, so with. Um, you follow our program to the nth degree on the serve. You're going to hang a string from the ceiling. A piece of tape comes down to your outstretched arm and racket. And you set up yeah. mirrors. Yeah. And then you write down from Don Leary. We have our own images, but his idea of the word pitcher method. You know, so skateboard, you know, bathroom scale one, bathroom scale two. Mm -hmm. And um, so the mirrors, the practice log, and then you do it twice a day. Just for minutes. Yeah. You can have an elegant, that was a Braden word, efficient, effortless, elegant. Efficient strokes are aesthetically appealing. Um, but, you know, I had a conversation with the dad, and the dad said, 
she says she's going to do it. But what we need to do is we need to follow up. But also, too, is that you know, if someone comes and they have an overall, she's a redo. Grips, swings, all, all four. You had the toss as well. Grip, swing, body, toss. Every shot. You can improve every shot. Some were better than others, but hey, the swing goes four feet behind you on the forehand. That's four feet back. That's eight feet of length. And you're only 11 years old. I say, well, let's take a time out from competition. Fortunately for her, she has the athleticism. But this is how it needs to be done. And, um, you know, the, the parent really needs to be the boss, be the architect. The parent's writing the check. What, what was interesting with, with him, though, the dad, he had a comment at the end, and he said that about, so, we sh you know, we should just do the routines and stay away from hitting. And he made a, something like, oh, I think I'm going to get, you know, anxiety if I don't see her hitting balls. You know, for him... He thinks, or maybe improvement is just through hitting. I remember he said a comment. Yeah, no, too. so um, that's where discussion, communication takes care of all problems with experience. She has experience. Every time she's hit a tennis ball, she has to measure the speed, spin, trajectory of the on oncoming ball. So with that, um, yeah, take a step back. If it, it was, uh, if it was math, it was reading. Sometimes you had to take a step back. Um, so with that being said, I wonder how many, not saying he will, but how many parents would get in the way as well, where they're like, oh no, let's now do this or, you know, and, and take them off the course, you know, was it start the course, stay the course. Now, how long does it take? People will ask us, how long does it take to change the strokes? And the wise guy answer I have is a little less than the ice age. That's where I do. I mean, I feel sorry for college coaches. What they inherit for people to play doubles yeah, the coach we were talking to, he said this, didn't he? Yeah. With, um, it'd be great if everybody came in on a five-year scholarship. But a lot of top, top kids go in with the idea of thinking, well, I'll just take college tennis one year at a time. And even the, you know, the best players, because of where the money is, they're not playing doubles. But people should play doubles to improve their game from the service line in. Yeah. She can play. Yeah, this, this girl can play. Um, I guess emotional roller coaster <laughs> comes to play when she's playing playing points. And it does look like I played a just played with her with a sponge ball and I've watched her play. It looks like at times a bit similar to the other girl, the Canadian girl. At times she's just trying to bang balls. You know, like just trying to hit the first wallop. Serve. You, you just, just, just wallop, wallop the yeah. ball. She's trying to hit a big first serve. Even when we were playing with the sponge ball, she was trying to hit an ace off the first serve, and you could see the body was like, she was muscling the ball. You could tell that. But yeah, she, she could play. I guess if she can get the emotions under control. And yeah. Yeah, and again, these comments, um, tangibles and intangibles. Overall, our tangibles are good. Now, we could say, okay, yeah, you know, when you turn, get that grip in the middle of three, don't have it towards the bottom of three, so you have options yeah. on the return. Yeah with your toss is too high, you open up, your feet are facing forward but at the impact point. But overall, I mean, she's already been recognized and invited to programs by the governing body of tennis in this country, the USTA. Um, stamina has gotten better, but it could, it's not where it should be, but she's fast. She's just blessed with speed. But I was telling her the intangibles is that you have to have that snap the fingers, okay, I'm training right now. So you can be giggling and having fun off the court, but when you get on the court, okay, it's treat practice like you would a match, but you have to focus, you have to have focus. And you know, here, here's one, you know, talk too fast, talk too loud, slow down. And you know, I, and I, I tell people, okay, you gotta be over 60 and bald, use nicknames, but she's a scary movie. She's a panic on the Titanic and she doesn't, she's not in a rowboat. And by the way, one of the uh, six water survivors, John Williams, Richard Williams, Richard Williams, he won the uh, US Open. They wanted to amputate his legs. 1912, ship went down in April, in September. He won it twice, but he won the US Open. Um, there's a book uh, I have about his story. Um, let's just do one more. 
Yeah. Um, there's, this doesn't include, um, we met, you met a lot more players in this, but this is just the players that were here. You read that. What's the name here? It's the name. No. Oh, yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. The one here. Yeah. No. Um, I think when he, he, he could play as well. I, I said, I said something to you, didn't I, that I thought was interesting. He, he lost to a few of the girls here, but we, you know, you do the tiebreaker test and he was out of, let's say, I think, well, it was two girls that did it and him. And I think you said he lost to both girls when they played points. What was interesting though, in the tiebreaker test, he did by far, he did by far the best out of the, Three, well, the two girls, sorry. So it's just interesting to see that someone, yeah, he did really well in that test, but then, and they struggled, but then he lost, I think, quite comfortably, you said, or, or yeah. Well, he's familiar with the tiebreaker test. When people take the tiebreaker test, you have to execute six shots cross court forehand, cross court backhand, downline approach shot, alternating volleys, overhead. Overhead goes anywhere in the court, but you have to hit the first three shots over the service line. And then we tell people, okay, you, you, when you do it the first time, we want you to learn to angle the volley, come in, but then you, we have you a volley down the line. We do it to a set as well. He's familiar with that, but um, he was here a few months ago. I've known him six years. He's only 12 now, and he's not clean. You know, he can play, and, and he's going to get all sorts of compliments, but inverts the angle, the racket hit on the forehand yeah. side. So, he oh. has a chain puller center on his serve, but more so is that logic, you know, connect the dots, red zone to red zone. That's a confrontation. Yellow to red, green to red. We say, okay, seven confrontations, red zone to red zone, yellow to red, green to red. Then you flip it and it's yellow to red, green to red. And then I tell people well, there's, there's seven, but there's very few where it's yellow to yellow in singles or green to green. And it's okay. He he still doesn't know how to play, um, but people shouldn't take that where it hurts their feelings. Don't get your feelings in the way. What I do, coaches that I've trained send me players, and then I'll make videos where you know one coach one coach was just at a national tournament with a player, and then the head coach, and then they'll say, well, she still doesn't know how to play, or he doesn't know how to play. They have to hear that. And it's not to make it feel bad, is um, you're playing at tennis, Welby Van Horn. You're not playing tennis. Um, in other words, if you were on a basketball team and this is your responsibility as the point guard, this is your responsibility, um, give me a position in soccer. You are a yes, I, um, striker. Striker, uh, yeah, attacker. This is your responsibility. This is what you have to do offensively, defensively. You're not doing it. Mm. And, you can't play. And what does that mean? Sure. You sit on the bench. Yeah. You, yeah. you learn you learn to do it the right way, then you will play. Mm. Tennis kids, it's like a foreign language to them. Um, how about let's just talk a little bit about the classroom for you here? Um, what are your thoughts when it comes down to what happens in our classroom? Parents, players, coaches. Yeah, it's interesting. Yeah, it's interesting. I think um, yeah, just all the uh, all the technical analysis you do is great and fact you bring in you bring the parents in and there's a lot of um there's a lot of communication with the kids and challenging kids with the knowledge and and yeah i think as well as you see that just the way you get people on board i think with the parents and just going going through the process but yeah we, we spend a lot of time in the, in the classroom but for me is was probably on court stuff is amazing as well but you, I don't know, it just seems like the classroom, you just soak in different information. For me, anyway, there's so many notes. Well, all these notes are from, mostly are from the classroom. Well, it's a tough thing is that when you're on the court, it's, um, hard, it's, hard, yeah. it's more difficult to take notes. Yeah. With Tennis World's a small place. Um, girl shows up today and she's wearing a Baylor's Bear a hoodie, a sweatshirt. And... That's her goal. She then I saw later that she wrote that down. She wants to play for Baylor, and 
Um, it's just timing. It's the evening before I talked to the Baylor coach, women's coach, and um, he asked if, if, if we could um, film some drills to improve service motions. So I said, yeah, we'll do it. I said, bring that sweatshirt every day. I'm not sure if we could do it today or tomorrow, but we'll, we'll do that. And um, to have that goal be so clear, I want to play at Baylor University with, I told her, she said, you do everything, you know, the fitness, you know, the mental, emotional training. It's just train, you know, you're only in the seventh grade or if, uh, say you're the eighth grade. I think she's in the seventh grade and she were to take the gap year. We already went through the board. How many days to prepare for that? And, you know, 1,440 minutes a day yeah. You got to get after it. Yeah. You just you just can't waste time. Um, you know, the one thing what we do is different is an emergent day. People come to visit, and you know, we've certainly people have come for you know three days, three weeks, three months, three years, and um, it's it's different if you're here for a really long period of time, or but it's different if you continue to come back. But you have to take the program home with you. And, you know, there's a letter from Jose Garris on the USDA needs to put the money back into player development, not make the budget cuts. Wayne Saban, not Wayne Saban, senior moment, Wayne Bryan. Wayne Saban, I was fortunate to hang out with Wayne Saban. I was in my 20s, he was in his 70s. He was a former top 10 player in the world. He, he was my buddy. But um, Wayne Bryan, the father of the twins, they should just drop the program. We have a program that's free. And it's again, it's a, it's a, you know, the, the eight pillars. I can talk on the phone to someone, and I just know if they've studied the Great Base. They know who the pillars are, mm -hmm. and um, that's where the, the 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 kids need to take a deeper dive, take more accountability, be more responsible. But the typical junior program, you know, we've got a lot of Canadian visitors from a club that I've worked at since '87, going back and forth, training the coaches. You know, the coaches will work, say, in a two-hour block. They teach this group, and another group comes. And um, there's, so there's not that reflection. Two types of thought, reactive and reflective. Do kids take notes? Um, they, they really do need to be mature beyond their years when, when they're goal-oriented. But also, to having the parents, if the, the way we do it, if the parents, especially short-term parents, if they want to come on the court, ask questions at any time. If they want to sit in the classroom, we encourage that. Because, um, you know, that, and I think that's one thing with, um, you know, one letter for the USDA to spend more money on player development. The first thing I would say is that, well, you put 100, 100 tennis courts in one zip code. The money needs to be spent on education, education, education. Mm -hmm. And, the parent needs consumer knowledge. Yeah. The pro needs product knowledge. Yeah. And if, they, if neither exists, it's just going in circles. It's just going in circles. Um, with, but tell us a little bit, you found the great base via the internet. You took it upon yourself just to, you, you actually heard me on another podcast, right? Yeah, I heard you on the Tennis Files podcast or something like that. Yeah, so I was looking, I think I was searching it, you know, and then I came across that podcast about the fundamentals. I was looking for his podcast and I saw fundamentals with Steve Smith or something like that. So when I was younger, I had an interest in like biomechanics. I remember I read a book when I just passed my LTA course. I was reading a book on biomechanics. So anyway, yeah, I listened to that podcast and then that just sent me to your stuff. And then, yeah, I just took a, a deep dive. I went through all of those courses and then I was, um, you know, implementing that on the court. I just felt like, no, I just felt like I had to see it, you know, in, in real life, just have, have the practical experience as well. Just, just not the theory. I felt like I had, you know, some of the theory, but you know, now coming here has helped just solidify and just help me understand things a, a little bit better. But I'm going to go back through the courses. When I finish here, I'm going to do Tennis Intelligence Applied again, go through them again. So, yeah, that's how I'll come across. I know. After you'd been here for, say, three weeks, three I said, days. said because, of, like, day one, we make a video for you yeah. just on your technique. And, say, three weeks later, go back and look at it. Still need to go through that as well. 
I'll, I'll go through that on, on the way back. And I, and I think as well, it was one of the biggest things for me is going through your content and then, you know, uh, getting Vic's book and Welby's book. It just made sense. And just coming through the system I came through, I know it just felt like a breath of fresh air, I guess. It just started, it logically, it logically made sense. And then I just, yeah, all, all in. Yeah. Go for yeah. It. And again, Welby's book, uh, it's scheduled to be up on our website. It's been really months now. And uh, we have some ideas to improve uh, these workshops to uh, generate more revenue, have more helping hands. Um, we want to be able to reach more people. Um, you know, I, it was someone asked the other day, uh, do they have a great base serve? And I said, please don't say that. <laughs> a serve is a serve. It's a, is it fundamentally sound? And the great base is, comes from a conversation I had with Richard Hernandez. Tennis needs a great base initiative. You know, same thing if somebody's learning, you know, say, taking English, mm. starting in kindergarten, you have the alphabet and working their way forward with the language of their, of their native land. And same thing with math with, uh, but no, and I think it's great that we um, have an opportunity that you want to pursue overseas that will allow you to work within the system. I, I've trained many, many tennis teachers for a decade throughout the eighties. And we felt like we, um, put forth a good effort teaching them in education and they went places where their experience didn't match their education. Yeah. And um, someone say, for example, if they've, if they've studied Vic Braden and it, it, it's unfortunate if, if it's, it's, the book is great. I have never read the book. And actually then the book in the videos, but then the book, the videos, and then actually working for Braden. Yeah, yeah. Or for me, the book, the video, working for Braden, and then having people study and practice, mm -hmm. you know, um, you know what, what he he put together, you know, um, you know, physics is not a fad, and uh, the dimensions of the court are not changing, the laws of physics are not changing. Um, but I've told people, you, you, you can learn more about the Great Base. Initially, now that you've been here, you have both experiences now. You have the online, and then you have the bricks and mortar. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But then you go out, you have to work it. Yeah. And that, that's how players have to get better as well. A huge problem is players, parents, think they outgrow the basics. I was saying, you know, Kobe Bryant, you don't know outgrow the basics. Well, I did that for a couple of years. Now I've moved on. I moved on to an advanced coach. Yeah, let's just take a couple of questions or two. We'll wrap it up. Yeah. Um, so one of the questions I have, you mentioned that the, the USA is 21 in the world for player development. So the question I have is, why is that? And I, was, I also wondered what, you know, what, who, well, who is the top three? Or what countries are in, are in the top of that player development? Well, one, uh, I'd have to find out the top three. I could take a guess. Um, for me, my travels, Czechoslovakia, the former Czechoslovakia, now Czechoslovakia, uh, the Czech Republic and Slovakia. I went there in 87. Uh, I mean, with Russia, whoa. I mean, how many players? And I know there's... Um, you know, players that are, say, from the Ukraine or um, Belarus, Russian-speaking players that are not necessarily Russian, but um, those two come to my mind right away. Um, Where was that? Russia? Czechoslovakia. Yeah. Russia. The, um, you know, I, I'm, I'm stuck to say, well, okay, the Italians, or okay, or the Canadians. No, I mean, like, I'm so close to Canadian tennis is that, no, you just have some hungry, hungry immigrants. It's not the, the Canadian system. With the U.S. being low, I think one thing people say right away, well, we don't get the athletes playing tennis. Well, we have 330 million people. But it's society. It's the way of life. You know, with, um, you know, the work ethic. Yeah, the work ethic. Um, but also, too, is that, Capitalism is not perfect. We're the largest economy in the world. 
And tennis, I would say the biggest thing is that tennis is just a business. Mm -hmm. It's not a sport. Yeah. And, you know, that's what we're trying to give back to the game. We have this free educational content. And I think that we're all all too quick in this country to, uh, and like they are in many countries, okay, let's blame the USDA. And, uh, but I think what does every individual do on their own? And, um, yeah, so I, I just think the, the, the work ethic, um, that, that would be why we're, we're 21. Oh, so I'll ask you one more than the other ones I can do off, off, off there. So um, the other one I had is uh, the psychological effect on strokes and shot selection when staying back versus coming in. So I guess to reframe it, the impact psychologically um, on your strokes when let's say you're playing against a doubles pair that are coming in versus people just staying back. Does that make sense? Uh, just reframe it one more time. So let's say you're playing doubles. Yeah. And just the impact of, let's say, me and you are playing together and we, we come into the net all the time. Obviously, the, psychologically for the other people, does that make them panic more? You know, what, what effects are there just from that versus me and you just staying back, playing one up, one back doubles? Because I guess we take away time. So is it is it a fact, you know, does the psychological then impact on the strokes them thinking you're panicking, if that makes sense? Yeah, I mean... Or is it just a matter of they, don't, they have less time? Well, a couple of thoughts on that. One, for myself, a mistake I make is you have to have people practice one up, one back. You, know, you and I, I went through a few things on how you show movement for one up, one back. You know, you run the triangle... So um, the, the ball passes the person at the net, you close in, and then it comes back. So you try to poach, try to intercept, and then it goes past you. So you go back to, to what Vandermeer used to call the hot seat. The, you're, you can't cover the entire court, so you concede the, the far angle of the court. You plug up the middle. That's what the hot seat is. So, okay, we need to practice that. Okay, let's play, let's, let's play one-up, one-back doubles. Uh, you're going to be in a situation where the other team's playing one up, one back. So, you know, I think live by the sword, die by the sword principles. Uh, you can't be so, you know, to the principle where, you know, say we're, we have no flexibility. You just have to just play a certain volley every time. Now, there's a difference between junior tennis, college tennis, and pro tennis. Junior tennis, you want to get to college tennis. And um, if you win – Playing one up, one back doubles at junior tennis, it's not going to help you get to college tennis. Mm. You know, I like the line I heard from Tracy Austin first about pro tennis. Pro tennis will find you; you won't find pro tennis. Same thing with the top college tennis. You know, the Power Five conferences, the coaches will find you; you won't find them. So, what happens is people don't develop instincts. So, if you never go forward, you never go forward. Joel Trucker, we've had all these podcasts now. He said, if a kid starts to go forward at 15, it's like they're learning a, a third language. So the, the sooner, the better. You know, go up there and make mistakes. So the you know, brain used to do this from a, a psychological standpoint, is that the comfort zone is at the baseline for most players. And then as they go to the net, that's when the anxiety level mm -hmm. goes up because they haven't been there and there's that fear factor. Um, if people are good at the baseline, they practice at the baseline. If they're not good at the baseline, they practice at the net. And, you know, people like to do what they do best. You have to work on both your strengths and weaknesses. But you can't just go with your strengths. But do people even know what their weaknesses are? Mm. When people play tennis, like we were watching points this morning. We went through the five targets on the court, the skill test. Everybody's in the room. We filmed this. You know, the emotional quotient. They're all intelligent enough. Here are the percentage posts. Here's the center mark. Put the treasures in the service box. And we're going to hit on the, for percentage tennis, we're going to hit on the inside of those cones. You know, they would say, okay, you're going to go to a sandwich shop. You're going to get a sub, take a napkin. Talk about kids doing some household chores. When I say, go to, when you go to the restaurant, take a napkin, draw a tennis court, and put those five dots down. And when you have lunch, just go through the seven concepts. My experience has been coming, why are we 21, that work ethic? Yeah. These American kids aren't doing that. They're living life like they already made it. Yeah, yeah. So 
um, yeah, that it is very, very interesting. Um, you know, you need to go now, you know, was it say with, with, okay, let's scale it down with a phone ball. We have, uh, an eight year old girl here playing so she can join the group. So, you know, it's okay. Are, are they, she going to play sets with the older, like, a uh, we have from eight to 13 right now, just a small group. Is she going to play sets with a 13 year old? No, but you know, they're tossing balls to one another. They're, they're doing some cooperative drills. The transition balls are good for every level of play. So the foam ball is the slowest. It's not so good on a windy day, but it's, it's, you know, we've, we've practiced with the trans different transition balls since you've been here. Yeah. Um, with, uh, what else? Anything? Uh, no, good. I've got a few more, but I'll, I'll save them. For Give us one more and we'll call it a day. Um, we, we hope with our podcast, we hope that your uh, yeah, here, listeners are benefiting from this. Here's, here's a good one, actually. You mentioned the other day advanced grips on the serve. So from two, you can slightly come, you can go either way. One was more beneficial for spin, and then I guess the other one is more beneficial to flatten it out, right? The pros, you said the pros may move it slightly. Yeah, so when you put a grip sticker on the rag and say, hey, Serve an orbiter on two, base knuckle of your next finger, heel pad on two. Um, Mark Dixon, I think he's highest rank, he was 32 in the world. He did an internship with us. Great, great guy. What a climb he had. He went from you know, being like a bottom player at this Jesuit high school in Tampa, bottom player at Clemson, but he worked his way up where he was the best player at Jesuit, the best player at Clemson. And he played for Chuck Creasy. And then Again, 32 in the world. I mean, I told Mark Dixon stories with uh, storytelling. Mark Dixon has a great serve. I took my son Connor to work with him on the serve. And like a baseball player where they put their hand in a different position on the, on the ball, is that if, we, if you take your hand towards the top, you restrict the range of motion with your wrist, but you can take your hand towards the top. It's going to close the racket face. And therefore, like someone's having a really bad day on a second serve, you know, I don't know when you're when you're teaching really young kids. Young kids, they, they know this in baseballs. You're not throwing. You're just teaching really young kids to throw the ball properly. You're not throwing. The really little kids, you're not. I'm really out of the line talking about baseball. They're not throwing the knuck, the knuckle ball, the curve ball, and, and, and such. The fastball. Can, can you just throw? Well, the same thing with the serve. We're talking about um, Spencer Johnson, who he he can serve now. But I remember telling his father, I said, No, 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 no. I said, You don't need to be talking about your kid about hitting slice and kick and, you know, reversing the spin. He just needs to have a basic service motion. Um, Brad Gilbert said about Mark Dixon, they were contemporaries who played at the same time. He was the best second serve in tennis. You know, he hit the backboard a ton. He worked on his serve a ton. You got to work on your serve every day. Kevin Anderson, supposedly, he hit 100 serves a day. Most kids don't serve. Most kids are not good enough to be a spot server. I mean, Exchanged some text messages today with Austin Krejcik's father. Austin's been ranked one in the world here recently in doubles. For our listeners, maybe they've heard that already. He's playing Kalamazoo. Steve Denton's there. Steve Denton uh, hired me when he came off the tour. I don't know more about tennis teaching. He told Austin, don't try to hit one ace. If he wins the tournament, just play in the U.S. Open. I was honored. I was in, they get, you could take two people. Uh, I went with his father with, uh, but, um, Mark Dixon, here's a great story for you. He, maybe he had a win over Lendl, and Lendl was at his best. He had a win over Vilas when he was one of the best top five players in the world. He beat him on clay. And he only attacked one time each set. He wasn't going to get let. He stayed back and he served and got in on his serve. But when he was rallying, he just stayed back. And he didn't give Vilas the chance to groove his passing shots. So he waits till it's four all. Towards the end of the set, he goes, I'm attacking. I'm just going to attack one game. Interesting. So, I mean, that's where you're, that's somebody who, you know, I love to listen to commentators on TV. You know, so like Curios and Roddick, they have podcasts. I listen to those guys. Those guys know a lot about tennis. They don't know a lot about tennis mass. They don't know a lot about teaching eight-year-old, nine-year-old, 10-year-olds. Andy Fitzell's always tell me, don't pigeonhole the great base. It's for every level of play. Yeah. But it's so important, you know, these things about American tennis, Jose Garris and Wayne Bryant. What we have would really help. 
American tennis. It's education. I was invited to the USDA back when they had more bulldozers and tennis balls. They have this big 100 court complex. Scott Schultz, who's now, he's no longer with the USDA, was there many years, whether he resigned or retired. But, um, with, uh, he said, well, we're thinking about putting a committee together for a curriculum. I said, there's no need to do that. You don't need to put a committee together. What, what Braden did, what Vandermitt did, what Van Horn did. It's like, really, we're gonna put a committee together? And they've been struggling. You know, they don't have a system. And the thing is, is that, you know, research, research, steel, baby, steel, you know, okay, this is rock solid. Um, so yeah, with, um, there's leeway on the forehand side from the very beginning. You want to make sure that kids aren't underneath the grips underneath, but, um, players should learn to hit with an Eastern grip forehand. Even if they're coming to us and they have a semi because they don't have options. Excuse me, they're, they're looking just to bang balls from the baseline. Do they play conventional approach volleys? Do they steal the ace? Do they ever take a second serve and come in where it's like a volley without a foul? They don't do it. So you have to go back, let's take a timeout and let's learn how to hang on to the racket efficiently. You're only 13 years old. You're only 12 years old. And you, know, you, you say that you wanna play college tennis. Okay, let's go back to the drawing board and let's rethink this and you know, let's have a complete game. Um, you know, the, again, the Braden philosophy one more time is hit every shot from every position on the court, singles or doubles, any surface. And um, so, you know, people do get to a certain point, um, like with grips. Well, you know, they're to work within their game. Work within their game. You don't necessarily have to change the grip. Uh, Ryan Reedy does a great job with two minute tennis. I not too long ago, uh, Jim Klein, who was a student of ours, and that's who Ryan worked for for years. So he indirect, indirect. Like so, I directly worked for Braden. You know, they, they certainly both met Braden and were close to him in certain ways, but they didn't really spend a lot of time working with Braden. The information is solid, so it, it, it could be passed down. And I didn't remember just telling Jim saying, "Say, hey, here's the." Because he asked me to tell you, he said, what do you think of this tape that Ryan made? And I said, Vic would talk about the racket face. He wouldn't get hung up on the grip. Mm -hmm. You know, that uh, um, I was a hitter when he worked with Tim Gullickson, who had an open racket face on the backhand. He said, no, he just, just like Lendl, turn the wrist down. Lendl, Lendl had a continental grip. McEnroe had a continental grip on the backhand, which has an open racket face. But Lendl turned the racket down, and McEnroe had the roll. That's yeah. one of the reasons of many that McEnroe and Tim Gullick's and both great players, they're looking to go forward. Yeah. You know, because that's because, okay, tennis math, let's measure their hitting zone. Mm, yeah, yeah. You know, and oh, yeah, they grew up on, you know, Lindo grew up on clay and this and that. But it's like, what does the racket head do? What, what, what's, the, what's the racket head doing in the backswing, the contact, the follow through? And um, so, yeah, I think you, you go a long time before uh, you start to tell people that you, you can maneuver the grip on the serve. But Lawrence, it's been great to have you here. I hope the listeners got something out of this. We'll put your notes up. Yeah, um, I think for a person to take notes and read, write notes and uh, go through the content more than one time, read, read uh, the books that we recommend. Um, it's uh, been an honor to work with you. Yeah, no, it's been great. And just wanted to thank you and Yvonne for the experience. It's been awesome. Yeah. And I learned a lot. It's great that you're going to continue. And, yeah, uh, definitely. <laughs> I enjoy uh, giving you a hard time down the road. <laughs> awesome. You want you want to tell the players that I play soccer better than you? Uh, <laughs> Lawrence is. Uh, he, of course, I never played soccer while you're here, but uh, so it's like in tennis. I tell people I'm undefeated. I haven't lost since 1987. But no, it was, it was fun to have you play soccer with the kids. Obviously, but I did tell you that I, I knew you're. I just knew. I yeah, said. You did, you, yeah. I said, hey, I can just tell by the way you run around the court, just jogging. Yeah, yeah. Um, it's. You know, I tell people about the Russian programs. In Russia, they have running programs. You just drop your kid off. You just show up for the first day, and it's a running program. You just take your kid for the first time, and the coach goes, yeah, okay, you talk to him a minute, and they just have you start to run around the court. And I'm not a trackie. I'm not an athletic, athletic you know, athletics. Uh, I come from track and field background. 
But I can tell when I just watch somebody, you know, just, okay, run around the three courts. Mm-hmm. Just, yeah. You can just tell yeah. where um, I could tell with yourself that, he's, that this guy, you know, it's a pretty safe bet. Okay, you got a, an Englander that uh, that you've, you paid a bit of football, but you could just tell. The, um, but no, education, education, education. And I think that like just you wanting to give the, the notes you have is that if it can help anybody out. And that's what we're trying to do with tennis is just help people out. And uh, It's great to have you uh, be in a position where now you can share this information because that's really what education is. Mm. I think a difference for us is that um, we're not plagiarizing. Yeah. We're not, you know, being pretentious like this is our information. Yeah. And, uh, but it's really just homework. Mm. Anyway, wave goodbye to the camera. High five. Awesome. Cheers. Thanks for being part of the podcast.